Like, and it was heartbreaking because Kobe was one of the best for it. He loved women's basketball. He brought his daughter to games. He, you know, was so involved all the time. And unfortunately, with his passing, you know, we've lost one of the really, really good ones on this earth. Have you noticed much of a difference since you started doing that? Like, because it, it's meant to like loosen your body and you feel like less pressure on the joints. Has that been like a noticeable difference? For sure. Yeah. Uh, I, th- I think it really helps uh, for me with my knee range of movement and my back. I like to keep my back strong and healthy. Um, but especially coming back from my knee rehabs, the range of movement kind of reduced. And I think it w- wasn't until really I did a bit of yoga that was previously um when I had a bit of bout of yoga that actually really helped me um with my range of movement so yeah completely uh endorse it for that I've noticed sometimes when I'm stretching and like the more tighter areas I can almost feel the blood flow coming back to the area once I once I hold it for a long period of time it's almost like this numbing feeling it's it's really cool (laughs) it's like why don't we do it more like it's one of those things that just gets overlooked it's like can we sell it so true Yeah. yeah On today's episode of Chatting with Champions, we speak to Mariana Tolo. She's a three-time woman NBL champion, two-time All-Star and Defensive Player of the Year. Mariana and the rest of the Opals are now chasing gold in Tokyo. Welcome Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. (laughs) Uh, Thank you. So we're speaking to you from Las Vegas at the moment? Yes. um, I'm in Las Vegas with the Australian Opals. We have um, preparation before the Olympic Games here, um, a chance to get together as a group because uh, six of our Opals were in um, play in the WNBA. So the rest of us kind of met them here in Vegas and and got to play some practice games against uh, both the US and Nigeria, which turned out really well because um, we found out that our practice games in Tokyo ended up being cancelled. So these are the only games that we get leading into Tokyo. So it was really important time for us um, to get that preparation together, get that game sense and get used to playing with each other again. How have you found playing with each other? Because you all come from, I guess it's with, with any basketball team that competes the Olympics, you're probably not spending that much time playing playing with each other how do you find coming together yeah um I think initially it's always a bit of an adjustment but because we've the same kind of group like an extended group has kind of been together for the past quite a few years and different tournaments and different people in and out a little bit but um because of that we've had formed connections with each other previously so it's just kind of about refinding them again and um, you know, getting used to playing with each other and being coached by Sandy. Um, yeah. It's been a while for some um, and then others have had her more recently. So it's been an adjustment all around. And you started off, so you started off, you went to the AIS, were with them for a little bit before, was it going to the French League? Oh, sorry, no, it was the, the Women's NBL League. Yeah. The yeah. yeah. So, yeah, so I um, started off, my WNBL, my semi-professional basketball life, really playing for AIS. And then after two years there, um, played in Canberra Capitals and played four seasons there. I won my first two seasons out of AIS, actually got to win championships, which, um, you know, probably in hindsight didn't realise how special that was until a bit later on. Um, And then after those four years, I headed overseas and I played in France for three seasons. LA for one season, had a major knee injury, came back, did rehab, then played with um, Canberra again, then went overseas and played in Turkey, um, had a season there and then injured my other knee, came home, did another lot of rehab and then played in Canberra for another three seasons. And then I'm about to head back to France to play um, one more season with them. Wow. <laughs> Is there a noticeable <laughs> difference between the... Um... The league, so the WNBL going to the French league. Is there a difference in the intensity, or is it all like fairly similar, similar competitive levels? Um, it's pretty similar. I think the French league is really good in that all of the teams are quite competitive. Um, the top teams are a whole nother level. You know, the 
often playing in Euro League or Euro Cup as well. Um, so they're a, a little bit of a step up, but it's quite competitive for the whole league. Um, the Turkish league, it was a bit more of a difference where the top teams were really, really strong and the bottom teams weren't as much. Um, and then, yeah, in the, in the WNBA, that, oh, everyone's really tough and <laughs> really awesome over there. And it, there's different styles all over the place too. You know, Australia, we like to really focus on our defence and, and play a kind of fast game. Um, Europe is very strategic, very team orientated, whereas the US is a bit more one-on-one, -on -one, a bit more, um, you know, showmanship and, and skill really and highlights the, the best players in the league, that's for sure. Wow. And, and so that, that period of the AOS when you were semi-pro, what's that look mm -hmm. like? Is that uh, you, you're still working in other jobs as well? Yeah, so when I was um, at the AIS, my first year there, I was in year 12. So I was finishing high school um, and, you know, training and playing with the AIS as well as being in the junior Australian um, GEMS team. And then my second year at the AIS, uh, I was had my first year of university. Um, I was a tour guide at the AIS, so I did a little bit of work there. And then when I left to play for Canberra, I was also probably semi-professional in those first four years too, and that I worked, studied and played at the same time. So it was pretty, really, really full on schedule. Um, and it wasn't until I went overseas to Europe that I did fully professional basketball for the first time ever. Wow. What was it like getting that first contract? Yeah, it was really, really cool. Um, I think I'd probably wanted to go the year before, but um, I knew I wanted to finish my degree before I did that. So hung around, finished that. And then when I got that, that contract to go play in France, it was awesome. It was playing in Aix-en-Provence, um, and I actually got to play with another Australian, Kayla George, who I'm playing at the Olympics with next week, which is really exciting. And we had the best time. We had two Canadian friends and our um, teammates who became really good friends with us and our team and also a lot of French girls. And it was just a really fun, special team with the coach and the great admin staff as well. And, and we had a really, really good time. Um, and I, I love just being able to play professional basketball, eat, um, breathe, sleep, everything, just basketball is cool. Wow. So you're, you're earning a, a sufficient amount that you don't need to work. Is that, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Amazing. Yep. So I was able to, yeah, fully live off um, what I was paid. They organized like your accommodation and the car for you to drive while you were over there. Um, and yeah, just have to pay for your, your bills and phone bill, internet bill, that sort of thing and petrol and food and all the normal lifestyle kind of things. But um, the rest is taken care of the, by the club. Yeah, was the, was the transition to France, was it a difficult one for you to start living over there or was the fact that you had a fellow Australian and a couple of other people you got on with early on, did that make that transition a lot easier? It definitely made the transition a lot easier. Um, you know, I'm so grateful that I had Kayla there with me and... Um, her now husband, Kylo, they were, they were awesome to be around while we were in France. And it, and it made that, you know, being away from home for nine months of the year, which is a really long time. And, you know, I think that first season, I got to go home to Australia once for Christmas for four days, um, saw my family and my boyfriend, and then went back over for another four months. And yeah, so it becomes like a long time to be without your family and friends and a bit of an adjustment to the lifestyle, that's for sure. But really grateful in that I had the support of Kayla and Kylie there with me. Had you known Kayla and Kylie before that point or it was only once you were in that environment did you, did you sort of realise the, the Aussie between you sort of bringing you together? Yeah, so um, Kayla and I actually went to the AIS together. And we played a lot and played so well together. It was actually perfect. And yeah. um, But it, we were, really weren't that close when we were at the AIS, but it was once we got to France and, you know, we formed a really special bond and, and we've been really good friends ever since. So, yeah, it's just been awesome. Wow. And then moving out of, so the, was it the three years you're in, you're in France? 
on your first contract. Mm-hmm. Is that is that right? And then so, no, so I had three different contracts. So I had one season in Aix en Provence, which is down south of France, um, and that one I played with Kayla. The next two I played in Bourges, which is um, a city right in the middle of France. Uh, only 60,000 people, but a basketball mad city. They love their basketball there. And I also got to play in EuroLeague that year, which was really cool. So the best teams kind of from a few different countries all play together in the Euro European League, kind of like the, the UEFA Cup and soccer. Um, yeah. And and so, yeah, I got that experience of playing against all these different countries and the best players in all of Europe and also from the States because different countries have lots of imports and things as well. So really, really cool experience to have um, those three years in France. It seems like the the, the women's basketball contracts are, are very short. Is that the case compared to like, I'm just thinking in my, in my mind, the men's NBA contracts. How do they mm. compare in terms of length? Yeah, I think it's personal personal preference as well. Some people like to do um, longer deal, have that security, um, and some people like only doing one year deals. And that's myself. I think in the NBA, it's a bit easier when you know you're going to be earning a certain amount of money, like millions of dollars. Yeah, um, <laughs> compared to, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> compared to tens of thousands of dollars, so it's, it's a very big difference and. Um, kind of forms part of the reason why people will you know maybe gamble a bit more because they don't have that financial security and stability that the NBA players do so so why would you then prefer the one-year contract is that just to Um, try your hand at a different a different city or at a different uh, league for sure so that I kind of always have that option if I wanted to go somewhere different and, and make a change or um, if I got a really good offer from somewhere else, then I could have the option to take that. Uh, my first, you know, four years in Canberra I had there and they were all individual years. Um, but, you know, I think that was the best for me because each year a different set of circumstances came up, but it, it ends up better for me to stay in Canberra for that amount of time. But then I just like the option of being able to choose what happens next. Well, wow. that would be so much fun just just the opportunity that gets presented of, of traveling to different countries. How much time have you spent almost being a tourist? Um, it's great when you actually get to play in Europe because you do get a bit of time to go and see different things in different places. So, for example, one season I had in Bourges, we had um, a period of time, we had four days off. And so I decided to go by myself to Valencia in Spain and just have some time there and sightsee and do all those sort of things, which is awesome. Um, It was quite frustrating though in France, often you'd get Mondays off and the Mondays were always the day where everything shuts down in the city. (laughs) Or Sunday, though, I can't remember which one. It was the day that always, things always shut down. And it was that, is that like a church day? to be that day off. I think oh, it's just the way it was because I think they'd work over the weekend. So then the Monday was the day that they'd have as their like family day um, to, to relax and, and yeah, um, do whatever they wished. What, what's day to day like? A lot, what's day to day life like in France compared to Australia? Because even going over to Europe on holidays, I've been to Greece once, but they have like siestas and rests from like yeah. two o'clock to five. Is it just like completely different or it's like fairly similar, but the work-wise, it's just a bit more relaxed in terms of don't have to work every day, don't have to do the eight hours, just chill out a bit more. Is that is that what it kind of feels like? Um, I guess so. It's, you know, in Europe, it's definitely like that. They work around that siesta schedule. So we'd go in, do a training in the morning, um, either a shoot-around or a wait session or, or both, and then come back to our apartment, have a sleep, have an eat, um, get ready to go again and then go to training, have a couple of hours of training and then come home, eat, maybe watch a bit of TV and then, yeah, sleep and get ready to go again the next day. It was, It's very much like that. Um, and you try and train twice a day every day. And I think Australia is kind of similar to that. Um, the, yeah, schedule's 
changed a bit and they with especially with the players association they tried to have that time because we're not a fully professional league still um they try to have time in in the middle of the day where people can work or um study or fill out you know that time where how they would please and and what kind of gets them by if they need to so i think we're working towards being fully professional but we're not there yet what's it what's it take to go fully or for the league to be fully professional um, it takes a lot of support from people, from um, fans, from sponsors, from the media, because when it comes down to it, it it's, it's bums on seats, it's media showing interest, it's TV deals, it's sponsorships, um, and it's choosing where you want to put your money, really as a supporter, as per someone who follows a sports team, for example, and what you're investing in and what kind of message you want to send to your kids or your family or, you know, what kind of role models you want to have. And I think it's, yeah, really important to, for people to think about that um, when they're deciding what they do with their um, extra income. What's it, what's it take to get extra bums on seats? Like, I feel like the UFC, I, I think of that as a sport that's grown tremendously. And, and you probably got caught up in all the, all the drama in Las Vegas last weekend with the UFC, with McGregor. And, but, like, they've done a tremendous job of growing, like, tremendously quickly over the last 10, 15 years. What's, what's women's basketball need to do? Um, I'm not sure. It's hard because, you know, we have the product. We have some of the best basketballers in the world. We're so good. Um, but it's hard when we're kind of underfunded. We've got um, less of support, not just financially, but also uh, in terms of staff and uh, people working within organisations that have the ability to just get stuff done. Um, so I think a combination of those things plus the media exposure is really, really important. And it's make media making choices to support women's sport. And I think, you know, Canberra do it really well. The Canberra Times are always thinking about, you know, having a 50% or more um, coverage of, of women's sport, at, uh, you know, in their paper. They're con like they're thinking about that and making those conscious decisions to do that. And I think other newspapers, other news outlets need to do the same thing and um, really buy into the positive stories that we have to share. So you said Canberra Times are looking to do 50-50 or, or slightly favoured towards the women's. What do you reckon other outlets uh, percentage-wise would be at in terms of male versus female? Sometimes um, you open a paper and it's, it's got, you know, one article or just some written words and no paper, no um, photos of any female athletes. And it just kind of brings you down because it makes you realise how different it is. And especially with all the different sports that we have going on these days, there's, you know, AFLW, obviously, and netball, um, there's hockey there's lots of different things all over soccer so many great um sports all around australia and it's just trying to find the ways to support them and i think if you if you have them visible in media then people will start to get interested and just follow on a little bit more and hear more about it and you buy into the story you know it's like having things on free to air tv um, people will watch if it's there and if it's an option. So, yeah, I think at the moment it varies all over the country. Some places do it really well. Some places don't do it as well and would have like a 20%. Some places um, I think would have 50%, 60% females. But, you know, I, I've had um, that thought before and it happened when I was in Western Australia one year that we were playing Perth in a semi-final and it was the day before a game and I opened the paper and there was nothing, not an article about the women playing the next day. And I tweeted about it saying how ridiculous it was and it should be there because you can't tell me that if it was a men's team, the Perth Wildcats who get like 10,000 people to a game, 
that if they were playing the next day, they would not have one article in the paper. And then the man who usually wrote articles for the female team, he contacted our club and said how he'd written so many articles in so many days. And I was like, that's not the point. It's not on you. It's about the organisation. It's about the strategy. It's about the vision and what you're trying to show and present. And and that was just like a prime example of that. And then you go to the game and there's barely 1,000 people there. And I was like, surprise, surprise. You know, mm. it's, and, and, and that's where it is. So, so media coverage, if it doesn't even need to be going on free to air just yet, just like one small step of media coverage, a few more journalists sure. posting about it, writing articles about it something like Like, that just like you guys you guys are doing what you do and choosing to support uh female sport it's about that and it's really important not just to have the big you know newspapers or um uh media firms to do that it's about independent ones as well reaching out and and so we really i really appreciate you for contacting me so thank you thanks for coming on we we love hearing about it and hearing everyone's story and and it's, it's super fascinating um, because, because like, yeah, it, I guess it is a business. So there needs to be money made and, and how do you bring yep. money in? And then it's like bums on seats. But then like, how do you bring the bums on seats in? It's such a, it's almost like a chicken before the egg. It's like, if we do this, will this happen? Or this needs to happen before this. It's, yeah. it's a difficult. And, it, and it's. And it, yeah, it is tough. And I think, but the storytelling is so important in that because there are so many stories out there of really interesting things about different people and different players, different sports. And it's about getting people to feel connected to that. And so once people feel connected, then they will have a reason to go, a reason to put their money where their mouth is, you know. 100%. Playing in the, uh, in the women's NBA, was there more coverage of that? Because because I feel like even in the last year, just from what I'm seeing, because I love to follow the NBA, I'm seeing just a lot more on, on the women's NBA and just recently on the draft. I actually saw quite a bit on the women's NBA draft. So I thought, cool. this is the first time I've seen this. Like, this is cool. Yeah, it is really cool. And I think it's something that they've really focused on the last few years and they've had... Um, a conscious effort from the players union um, that come together and try and make some changes within the league and that's been a big driving force in Australia as well the Australian Basketball Players Association have been really great making some fundamental changes in our league it's been awesome and it's the same in the WNBA they've made quite a few changes over the last few years um, with the new collective bargaining agreement and and I think that helps visibility as well and you know, initially and traditionally, the WNBA had a lot of stigma and stereotypes around it, but I think some of that is going now, and especially with the support of different NBA players. Like, and it was heartbreaking because Kobe was one of the best for it. He loved women's basketball. He brought his daughter to games. He, you know, was so involved all the time. And unfortunately, with his passing, you know, we've lost one of the really, really good ones on this earth. But Lots of NBA players are now doing the same thing, and that's really helping us as well. Yeah, hundred percent. Who, other than Kobe, has been uh, crucial and, and fundamental in, in progressing women's basketball? Um, so the season that I played um, in the WNBA was for the Los Angeles Sparks, and a part owner of that is Magic Johnson. Um, so he's definitely one because he's put his money into our league and our team and there's a number of owners in the WNBA that have done the same thing yeah that's that's really awesome to see well remember when we were looking at um the billionaires in sport yeah he, I don't think Magic Johnson was a billionaire but he was one of the ones that was on the list of um of wealthier sports people yeah he's put his money into something he's like clearly passionate about women's basketball and growing that and it's always good to have someone like a legend of the sport involved in trying to make it happen it definitely helps because it is exposure at the end there isn't it mm. for sure is there is there anyone you look up to uh socially basketball wise and and take inspiration from them i think if you look at ash Barty at the moment um 
killing a phenomenal it. athlete, killing it and owning it and also seems like a really humble person, which is quite rare in a sport such as tennis. And you often have, like for me, I definitely have this vision of all those superstars being you know, a little bit crazy. <laughs> It'd be hard not to be. Uh, having, I agree. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like having something about them which makes them so good at their sport, but it's so cool that Ash Barty seems like a normal person who's just a phenomenal athlete and a, and a great person to be around and a great representative for Australia. Yeah. I'm saying, are, you a, are you a tennis fan? Uh, a yeah. Like, I, I, I a little bit you know i'll watch it here and there and i've never been to the australian open i would love to do that one day um but it's really cool when that comes around every year definitely tune into it on tv yeah no, I'm, a, I'm a i'm a big tennis fan and actually one person that's fascinated me lately is naomi at soccer just so young so good and just the amount of coverage netflix are doing a docuseries on her i saw a trailer for that and i'm really excited to see that because she stepped down from Wimbledon because I think she had there was something interrupting and then that became the focus oh sorry her mental health she was saying she was having mental health issues that became the focus yeah. other than the whole Wimbledon tournament and then yeah. she goes actually like this shouldn't be the focus it should be Wimbledon the focus I'm just gonna bow out and I don't, yeah and like that was an incredibly noble thing to do to one take mental health as a priority and then also just to like a holistic view of like and very selfless and that like I shouldn't be in the limelight for this uh Wimbledon is way bigger than I am I thought mm. that was incredible yeah really, really cool really inspirational yeah post post game what's what's the recovery sort of look like here Um, so normally after you're talking about like after a game, what do we do normally? Yeah. yeah so um, post game, we'll stretch down immediately after the game. We'll get um, a protein into us. So we'll have a protein shake and then head back, um, do ice baths. So we have bathtubs in our hotel. We fill those up with water and go. ice and sit in those for about um, eight minutes and then, if for whatever reason that's unavailable, you'll do a hot cold shower where you um, change from hot to cold every thirty seconds or so. That's that's just the shower um, nozzles you're, you're switching. Yep, 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 yep. Um, some places it's it's good because you get you know hot and cold like extremes of both. But say somewhere like Queensland, the cold water is not really cold, so it doesn't <laughs> work so well. Um, but yeah, then that's pretty typical recovery and then you'll have a meal after the game normally as well um depending on what time you play and that sort of thing and and then here while we're here we get some treatment by the physio or our um physical therapist and um and and then have a focus on really having a good night's street sleep as well as doing some other recovery things like rolling and stretching when we can too and, and you bring that yoga into that as well um, sometimes, yeah. So when I played in the WNBL hub last season, um, I would do a fair bit of yoga as well as a form of recovery. Um, you know, there's different kinds of yoga and some a bit more of a workout and some more meditative. Um, so, yeah, I would probably do more of a meditation stretch, kind of go through the range of movement. Is that more so just to wind down uh is it, is it more for the meditative aspect or is it more for the stretching aspect then? A bit of both, a bit of both. Um, sometimes it can, it can be hard to wind down after games because you're thinking about everything that happened and analysing it and trying to, you know, analyse what, what worked well and what didn't and what we can adjust for next time. Um, so sometimes it's about that, but then also for your body standpoint, for getting it nice and loose and, and ready to go again whenever you need to. Yeah, 100%. So, so we're not long now until, and, and when everyone will be listening to this, you'll have started your, your run for gold. Yeah. So, so in your draw, you've got uh, Puerto Rico, China, China and Germany, is that? And Belgium. Belgium. So okay. we have Belgium first on the 27th, then uh, 
Puerto Rico, I believe, on the 30th and then China on the 2nd. So, um, and then the first game's at 6.30 in Australia, second one is 10 p.m. and then third one is 10 p.m. also. So, yeah, some really tough games. Uh, Belgium will be tough. They have a really good team, um, a couple of really good players and uh, they play at a nice, temp- a nice tempo pace and and really, yeah, try and get out on the floor and disrupt some people. Um, China are normally tough. They've been up and down over the years, but they're quite big and physical right now. So that will be a challenge specifically for me in my position to keep those players under control. And then um, Puerto Rico fast can really shoot the ball. So we'll have to look at um, limiting their scoring opportunities for sure. Does the, uh, does the Olympics bring a different intensity level in terms of like, it happens once every four years. It's like different compared to like a playoff, say for a normal league that you'd play in. It's like a different level of intensity. For sure. And like the Olympics for us is the pinnacle of our sport. So everyone brings their best game and there's only 12 teams. So every game is a hard game, no matter who you come up against. It's been hard for teams just to get there and so then when they get there they bring it and they want to make the best of their opportunity so it is a whole nother level a whole nother step up and you've got to be ready to play day after day you can't you know snooze for one moment because then it might be all over that's the thing because it's not like your, your typical your playoffs where where you've got seven games to <laughs> to figure it out <laughs> yeah 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 and and that you know that brings different strategy in it and being able to adjust and change different things but this how is do, like you've got one chance if, if you're um, on that seven it, game. It, it makes a really big focus on i think on preparation beforehand and the coaches have the tough job of making sure they have the scout of their offenses their defenses their the players down pat and we all have to soak up that information and luckily at this olympics before the um round games we have two days off between each game so we have time to prepare and get ready for each game and so that we can focus on it one by one um but sometimes it's not that easy and sometimes we don't have that much rest so this will be really good yeah uh, I'm excited to see it, and especially Tokyo, the the times that everything's on, it's sort of perfect for us where where it's not too late, but like it's after work, well, a lot of it. So. Yeah, we can just yeah. walk up home and just watch it. It's good. Yeah, it's perfect, <laughs> and I think like the whole world needs it right now too, with everything that's going on in COVID and all the restrictions and different travel limitations. And I think a lot of um, country pride would be good for everyone's heart and soul, and especially in in Australia where all the restrictions and stuff keep going on and off for some people and it would be so tough, but it gives us a bit of, you know, national pride and something to cheer about. 100%. And then, and then after the Olympics, are you, what, what's your plan? Are you doing anything before you head to France? Yeah. So I'll come back home, um, quarantine for two weeks. <laughs> then I'll have a week basically to pack up all my stuff. Um, hopefully catch up with family and friends and then head over to France. So it's going to be a crazy week of getting lots of things together. Um, Also having like a a party engagement slash um, going away slash Tokyo celebration party, just so I can try and see everyone before we go. Congratulations. I'm guessing that's your engagement party. Yes. 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 Congratulations. um, My boyfriend of 15 years proposed to me. Um, Oh, maybe a month or so ago now. And so, yeah, they're really exciting and looking forward to celebrating with everyone. Wow, that's awesome. Have you spent much time with them over the last month at all? Has it um, so before, before Vegas, yeah, we're based in Canberra together. But, um, yeah, obviously he won't be able to come, which is a shame. All my family were planning on coming. And so um, when that changed I think they were very disappointed and devastated because they came to the last Olympics and had a ball of a time even more so than me so <laughs> they were shattered um, well, but yeah it is what it is what was what was competing at Rio like it was tough um really tough every game was hard and we kept winning games just like it was close we pulled some from nowhere for sometimes and 
and we ended up finishing top of our pool and then we crossed over against Serbia and who came fourth in the other pool and ended up losing that game by two points. So that was really heartbreaking. Um, Olympics is challenging because there's so much going on and this one will be completely different as well. But then it was like, um, it's hard to balance trying to do everything you can for your sport while also enjoying the experience. Um, a lot of the time you don't get to enjoy it as much as you want to because you're so focused on your goal and what you're trying to achieve. So, yeah, it's challenging to do that. But the best parts of going to the Olympics, I think, are uh, seeing different athletes. So I got to walk past Rafael Nadal in the village and um, we saw Princess Mary and, you know, just random different people. Um, it was really cool. And, and the gear that you get and also, like, kids from schools from all over Australia draw pictures and they put them up on your walls and your rooms. And it's so cool to see it and read what they all have to say. And it reminds you when you were a kid doing those, you know, same little things. I remember writing a letter to a basketball player in one of the teams. And I think I wrote something ridiculous, like <laughs> you've got the same last name as my best friend or something. Like that. <laughs> That's amazing. Yay, how embarrassing. <laughs> but, <is> um, <laughs> but it is, it's great to see that and um, be reminded of why you're there. Yeah. When you were in Rio, did you have many of those, those fan moments where you're like, hang on, I've been watching you, <laughs> like, like, because that's what for I'm sure. like with Rafa. <laughs> yeah, oh, for sure. Like, so with Rafa, um, myself and Leilani were walking with um, Steph next to us and Leilani and I saw him and smiled and he smiled back, but Steph was looking up in a completely different direction and I was elbowing her and she was like, what? I said, you just miss Rafa. Like, come on, Steph. Tune yeah. in. But um yeah, the heaps of those fan fangirl moments. Pal Gasol, I got a photo with him. Um but again, I don't know what that's gonna be like this time around because of COVID and how much contact we'll have with other people. But again, another really cool thing from last time was meeting Austra other Australian athletes. Like I met Max Esposito, who is a um modern pentath modern pentathlete. pentathlete. Yeah, yeah, modern pentathlon. Does the pentathlon? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think yeah, I think that's a, yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, Max, and then yeah, ended up running into him a few times down the track, and yeah, it was lovely to get to know him and just you know a different person outside of your sport, and yeah, really really cool. Is there any uh, is there any people you're hoping to cross paths with? Ash Barty would be great. Yeah. I think all of us have said that like our team would love to get a photo with her. So that's really cool. But I'm sure she'll be hot property. <laughs> <laughs> I imagine so. Yeah. That'd be that'd be so awesome. I mean, because it's sort of what you hear about, like just a culmination of like the best. The best athletes in the world. Yeah. yeah. And then seeing someone who's like so publicly achieved so much already and still with so much want to go. It'd be awesome. She'd be great to me. That team photo, the photo would be good though. It'd be a huge height difference in the yeah. photo across the <laughs> yeah. We have some short girls in our team, so it'll be all right. Yeah. <laughs> we'll stand at the back like usual. Yeah. Oh, well, thanks so much for coming on to the show, Mariana. It's been really awesome no to talk to you. At all. Really good. Yeah. No, thanks for having me on and I really appreciate um, your support too. I've just realized I've got to announce the, the oh, giveaway. No. Yeah, so if you're listening right now, we're giving away a $20 gift card to the first person to DM our Instagram at Outspoken Show Mariana from the Opals. And the first person to do so will win a $20 gift voucher. But thanks, thanks for listening. Um, thanks for coming on, Mariana. If people want to follow you, follow your journey, what's what's your Instagram handle? Instagram is my name. So Mariana. M A R I A W N A T O L O. Um, that's my Instagram handle. Just Amazing. my name and same as uh, on Twitter and Facebook is Mariana Cholo Athlete Page. So yeah, follow those. Awesome. awesome. Thanks for coming on. Thank you. No, thanks for having me. Awesome.